to stay and follow along with our proceedings this evening. There are copies of our agenda on either side of the room, so if you'd like to pick up one and follow along with our proceedings tonight, I would invite you to please do so. There will be multiple opportunities for public comment, both with respect to items that are on our agenda tonight, as well as respect to items of a general nature. And for those of you interested, we have a segment called number, it's item number four on our agenda, public comments of a general nature. So if there are questions or comments of a general nature with respect to items not on our agenda tonight, that would be the time to, to get up and talk about them, but we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to it. And then there will, of course, be opportunities for public comment with respect to the items that are on our agenda tonight. So with that, it is customary for us to begin our meetings by reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. So at this point in time, I would invite everyone present to please stand and join us in reciting the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And now I'd like to ask our fine village clerk, April Holden, to please call the roll. Commissioner Jose? Here. Commissioner Olson? Here. Commissioner Rankin? Here. Commissioner Barnett? Here. Commissioner Neustadt? Here. Commissioner Durkin? Here. Mayor Tully? Here. Thank you very much. It brings us to item three with respect to uh, minutes of prior council meetings. We have one set of council meeting minutes to review and approve tonight, and those are our minute, the minutes from our regular council meeting on November 19, 2013. Do any members of the Village Council have any questions, corrections, or changes to those minutes? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those minutes are approved. And just like that, we are at item four on our agenda, which is the segment of the meeting when we entertain questions and comments of a general nature. If any members of the audience have any questions or comments of a general nature with respect to items not appearing on our agenda tonight, now would be the opportunity to please come to the podium. The protocol is to please share with us your name and your address, and we would welcome hearing from you. Are there any questions or comments from any members of the audience with respect to items of a general nature with respect to items not appearing on our agenda tonight? We have some folks coming down. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Ryan. I live at 1927 Bending Oaks Court in Downers Grove. Uh, I have some comments on the stormwater fee, but it's not about the rates. It's about the structure. So I ask if I could give those now. Uh, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. But if you start talking about the amount, the rates, then I'm going to have to cut. I'm no, just cut me off. <laughs> Please go ahead, Mr. Ryan. Uh, okay, Mayor Tully. Thank you for continuing to provide an open comment period and an opportunity to speak. I would also like to thank each and every one of the council members for your willingness to share your time and talents and give back to the village. Uh, I've, been a, I've been the parish administrator at St. Mary of Gaston for the last five years where I'm responsible for the managing of the day-to-day -day operations, the facilities, and the budget. My wife and I have been residents of Downers Grove for over 30 years. It is a special place and a great place to raise a family. The churches are both a key component and element of the fabric of our community. This tax will have a major impact on the religious not-for-profits, particularly the small to medium churches. It will also impact the 8,000 parishioners and over 2,700 families at St. Mary of Gaston. I come from a business background and had a career in financial markets for over 35 years, managing my own company and that of another. I know the importance of budgeting and its impact. I've seen firsthand how churches stretch each dollar to provide the greatest benefits to their congregations, to our community, and to the poorest of the poor. The village has made cuts to the social services over the years, just one of which was the shutdown of the human service department. The churches have gladly responded and tried to fill the gap. For the village to continue to be a special place, I believe it requires a commitment to be socially responsible. St. Mary's has paid over $3,300 for the first nine months of this year for this fee. One way or another, this fee will impact our 100 plus ministries, whether it is assisting the homeless through pads, the food pantry run by uh, St. Vincent de Paul that provides food for the less fortunate, our staffing, our local vendors we use. And I can go on and on. Uh, the reality is that the stormwater issue has proverbially had the mentality of kicking the can down the road for many years. Perception is that, that, that was, this is the easy way out by charging a tax. What other solutions or creative ideas has the village reviewed to provide funding for this initiative? St. Mary's and other church leaders wholeheartedly support the complete elimination of the tax 
for religious not for profits. So far on this issue, so far on this issue, we have agreed to disagree with the council. In closing, as I stated earlier, my wife and I have called Downers Grove home, our home for over 30 years. It, it is a community that is special. The role that the churches play both economically and socially should not be underestimated. As testament to that, I would like to distribute a summary sheet of a HALO report that was prepared by the Partners for Sacred Place, uh, Places for St. Mary of Gaston. Uh, can I give it to staff? Please. Hand Thank you. Uh, this report indicates incredible numbers as to, as to the economic impact that just one church, our church, has uh, out of the 25 churches in our community. The dollar value, uh, as stated in this report, shows that the economic value we bring is over $16 million. Uh, I, was, I was really surprised by that number. I had no idea it was going to be that high. And as you will see, there are five silos that comprise this figure. We hope to have Amy Shackman, Regional Director of Partners for Sacred Places, attend a village council meeting in the near future to answer questions and provide more in-depth detail on this summary. I want to thank you for your time and uh, hope you take care. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for being here and thank you for your comments, Mr. Ryan. Other questions or comments of a general nature? Good evening. Good evening, Councilman and Mayor. My name is Frank Bremen. I live at 6560 Hillcrest Road in Downers Grove. Recently, I sent an email to the council people and the mayor, and I'd like to read the email if you don't mind, and I'll make some few comments after that. It says, hello, I'm Frank Bremen, and my wife and I live at 6560 Hillcrest Road, next to the newly created yard waste dump at Palmer and Hillcrest Road. This yard waste collection site has been in use for about three years. The village hires an outside leaf pickup company to remove the leaves from the village streets. Last year, the contractor was required to bring the yard waste to Hillcrest and Palmer and dump the waste into a large semi-truck. Bad, but not the worst situation. As the leaves were dumped, a lot went over the side and into the neighborhood. This year is unbelievable. The leaf pickup contractor was instructed to drop the leaves on Palmer. After a while, the pile extended from Hillcrest Road to the end of Palmer, which is a full block, block and a half. After a few days, the village workers came and scooped up what they could with large equipment. At this time, we felt relief as the program had stopped. Prior to the first dumping of yard waste, I had raked the leaves up from our property. It sure looked nice and cleaned up. It was hardly a week later, and the same situation was happening the leaf contractor was dumping yard waste next to our house. At this time, I called the village and asked why this is. The village works person referred me to a fellow named John with the extension number of 5466. He informed me that this would stop and a new collection site would be found. After the village workers came and removed the yard waste again, I cleaned up the leaves from our property. Each time the leaf contractor would drop a load of the leaves, they would blow all over, they scattered again. Great, I thought, I'll clean up the property for the last time. Well, to my surprise, the yard waste was still open. The contractors are dumping the leaves, they're pulling all over, and I'll have another cleanup of the property. Well, by this time in the letter, you can surmise that I'm not happy camper. Can the yard waste dump site be located to a more industrial area, or the contractor dump them into a ready truck or some other solution? Okay, and in the email, I put my uh, email address and all that there. Now, what happened there then, they came and they picked it up again. And I says, oh boy, you know, and I says, what? I'm not gonna go out and clean up the yard right away. Well, fortunately I didn't. He came back and he dumped a whole nother load of, of yard waste. And it got so long that they were going to go past Hillcrest Road. So to clean up that solution, solution for that was, they had one of our great big front end loaders come and they scooped it all up into about a 12 foot pile of leaves, okay? And the kids enjoyed it because they all wanted to climb on it and dad says no, okay? So um, then the yard waste collector came and dumped more loads and yesterday, yeah, yesterday came and they picked it all up. It was quite a sight to see. This, I don't know if you know of our front loader. Our front loader, my God, I think the 
front of it is half of this desk. Trying to scoop the leaves that were all on the parkway on the other side of the street off of the thing. It was quite a dance. He was a tremendous operator. He is. But 99% of the leaves are still there on the parkways, and my yard is still full of uh, leaves again. Now, I hope to get it cleaned again once more time. Because if you don't leave, if you leave the leaves on your lawn, you got the rot and all that good stuff from the leaves. But I'm sure hoping that next year we can come up with a better program than we have this year. Okay? And with that, I leave you. I, uh, I also have videos for this, pictures and whatnot. But um, let's see what happens. This year, the contract, hopefully, it's done with. You know, we got some nice weather for leaf pickup. And they might come back with the leaves again. One thing I noticed with this here, too, though, as we progress with this leaf pickup program, which we don't have, it, it must, I don't know where the money comes from. But I noticed more and more people are saying, oh, there goes the street sweeper. Out go the leaves to the street. So are we creating a problem or correcting a problem? A better solution would be to give all Downers Grove residents a free bag and let them put a sticker out there for a collection and do away with all this uh, uh, leaf pickup. Something, we have to come up with a better solution than people putting the leaves on the street, picking them up, and I know I can't be the only yard waste, I hope I'm not the only yard waste that in Downers Grove. Oh, and one day we had a chance, he dumped the load, and we were coming back from the store, the wife and I, and we says, ooh, there he goes, let's follow where he's picking up the leaves. Well, we live two blocks west of Dunham. We chased them, and boy, did they drive fast, past Main Street, and then he was going on Main Street a couple, another street, and then he dropped this thing and he started picking up leaves so we could pick them up there and bring them back to the west side of Dunham. So I do hope we can come up with some solution next year and hope it has ended for this year. Thank you for your time. Mr. Bremer, thank you for your comments and your email. I noticed that you were diligent enough to even send an email out on Thanksgiving itself on this very topic. And I believe that uh, we have referred this uh, matter to our village staff for some follow-up in one way or another. So thank you for, for coming. I know I saw the email on Thanksgiving, and I got another one to me. I believe it was yesterday. Okay. Thank you. Now it's, been, it's been put in the hands of the right people. Thank you for being here tonight. Other questions or comments of a general nature with respect to items not appearing on our agenda tonight? <coughs> Hello, my name is Brian Deedy. I live at 6508 Hathaway. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I was, I know this, uh, this comment is going to be a little tardy per se, but um, last meeting that I was at in November, it turned into the uh, stormwater marathon and I just didn't want to share my thoughts that night. But whoever was responsible for the Halloween uh, window painting in downtown Downers Grove should really receive uh, a lot of commendation. Uh, I thought it was a great family event on the Saturday when everybody was painting the windows. And then a couple days after uh, Halloween, professional crew comes and cleans it all up. So I just want to uh, say job well done for whoever is responsible for that. Well, thank you for sharing that. That would be the uh, Downers Grove uh, Rotary and uh, uh, downtown management uh, works in conjunction with them for that event. But thank you for sharing it. I think since it was on TV, you can consider that uh, message was received. Thank you for sharing that. Other questions or comments of the general nature with respect to items not appearing on our agenda tonight for any members of the audience. Hearing none, that brings us to item five, council member reports. Do any members of the village council have any items that they would like to report out at this point in time? Let's start with uh, Commissioner Barnett. I have no report, Mayor. Commissioner Olson. No report. Commissioner Jose. No report, Mayor. Commissioner Rankin. No report. Commissioner Durkin. And here's your new stat. Well, I have a lot, but I'll only do a few. Uh, there's a couple well, of things going on. Everyone else their time yeah. to you, apparently. <laughs> there's a couple of things going on in your village right now. Uh, there is a Christmas light recycling uh, option for folks who have tried to put up their lights and they don't work like mine didn't. You can take them over to the um, Public Works facility. They'll take your uh, used and not working Christmas lights and recycle them for you. Also, here at Village Hall and next door at the police department, there's a coat drive. Uh, that actually goes through January 13th. Uh, to collect gently used coats and winter accessories, winter accessories for all ages. So your village is working to uh, 
help you recycle and to find clothes and clothing for those who may need them this winter. Uh, it's a great option for us that as you go through your kids' bins of clothes and you find something that you're not going to use anymore, you can bring it down here and we'll uh, get it to somebody who needs it. That's all I have tonight, Mayor. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I will have a ComEd update when I get to the Mayor's report later tonight. Just a couple things real quickly at this juncture. Uh, one, another great event that we had this past weekend was the annual tree lighting ceremony that took place over at the Main Street Station. And once again, we had a lot of people who came out for that event and want to thank everyone who was involved in making it possible, including the family that donated the tree, the Lutz family. One thing I do want to notice is uh, there were a number of people that grabbed me afterwards because the timing of the actual lighting seems to fluctuate over the years. And I, I realize that we can't exactly gauge or dictate when Santa arrives because Santa arrives when Santa arrives. Um, but there were some folks that uh, showed up at 428 and the tree was already lit and, and pointed out it's at 430. So one thing that we'll try to do in the future is coordinate things better. Maybe we'll, we'll improve our communications with the North Pole and make sure that Santa arrives at a time that allows for, on the one hand, the tree to be lit at the designated time, but also if it happens to be weather more inclement than what we were fortunate to have this last time, that folks aren't out shivering in the cold as has happened in some other years. <coughs> So it's a delicate balance, and for anyone that showed up a few minutes and didn't see the actual lighting, uh, our apologies, but we'll, we'll continue to try to coordinate things with the North Pole and the high school band to, to make sure that it all comes off um, at the, uh, the advertised time. But it, it, it is, it is not, not easy to do, but we do do our best. Uh, and then second of all, I wanted to really congratulate everyone who participated in the gingerbread house construction contest that was also taking place uh, during the gingerbread festival. And I don't mean the giant gingerbread figures that were throughout the downtown, but I mean the actual houses that were put together by families, by students, and by uh, professionals, as well as some businesses that were located uh, throughout various businesses in the downtown and in one particular space downtown. And this was a uh, event that was done in conjunction with DuPage Habitat for Humanity uh, and I think it was a very successful event. I had the, the good fortune of, of being one of the judges to judge the different um, gingerbread houses. And it was really quite amazing what people can do with, with gingerbread. Uh, really creative, really well constructed. Fortunately, there were, you might wonder what qualifies me to be a judge of a gingerbread house. And you, that would be a fair question to ask. But be assured there were actual people like real architects who were also involved in the judging team. And, and weighed in on it. So there were both fan favorites and the judges favorites. But I, I hope that that continues to be a uh, a well-received event within the community because it got people out and walking around and things for the kids to do and visiting different businesses, which of course was right around um, Small Business Saturday, so all of it tied together quite well. So I want to again thank everyone. Put a, bless you. Put a lot of uh, time and effort into those gingerbread houses as part of the festival. I think that was a another good community event that hopefully will be will be a tradition going forward. Uh, so that's all I have at this point in time. Like I said, I'll have a comment update later on. But that now brings us to item six on our agenda, which is reserved for public hearings. And we do have, in fact, a public hearing tonight. This public hearing is with respect to bond, a bond issuance for Avery Coonley School. And I will first read what the procedures for the public hearing will be, and then we will have the public hearing. This public hearing uh, will please come to order. This public hearing has been called by the Village Council, the Village of Downers Grove, to consider the issuance by the Village of Downers Grove I'm sorry, uh, the, 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 consider the issuance by the Village of Downers Grove of revenue bonds, series 2013, in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $6.3 million with respect to the Avery Coonley School Facility located in the Village of Downers Grove. Notice of this hearing was published in the Downers Grove Suburban Life newspaper on November 13th, 2013. The procedures for tonight's meeting will be as follows. First, there will be a presentation by Jim Snyder, bond counsel for the Village of Downers Grove, who will present information related to the bond issuance. Second, there will be an opportunity for questions or comments from members of the Village Council. Third, there will be an opportunity for questions and comments from members of the public. These may include either written or oral statements as well as any petitions or other documents or information relevant to this public hearing. Fourth and last, thereafter, we will adjourn the hearing. At this hearing, witnesses will not be sworn, although there will be an opportunity for final questions or comments from the Village Council, just in case anyone was concerned about that. And again, at this hearing, witnesses will not be sworn and a verbatim written transcript of the statements or testimony given at the hearing will not be prepared. However, a recording of the procedures will be made on village equipment and retained until minutes of the hearing have been prepared and approved by the village council. So with that, we will then go to the presentation by Mr. Snyder, bond counsel for the village of Downers Grove. Good evening, Mr. Snyder. 
Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, good to be good to be back. Um, this is a conduit bond issue for, as the mayor mentioned, for the benefit of, of Avery Coonley School. It is, um, the, the use of the proceeds will be to refund a prior bond issue issued by Downers Grove, structured very similarly uh, in 2004, and also some new money for some um, expansion of the facility um, here in, um, in Downers Grove. The amount is uh, approximately $6.3 million. Uh, Downers Grove is not liable on these bonds. They're, um, it's not an indebtedness under any debt limit. Um, under no way a default on these bonds would be a default um, of Downers Grove. Uh, or, or, and in addition to that, um, there is, in Downers Grove is indemnified uh, for issuing the bonds, anything that, any cost that would potentially be incurred in, in, in the future, uh, and working with, uh, with legal staff to make sure that that's, um, that, that's uh, appropriate. Uh, the uh, TEFRA hearing is required because this is a private activity bond, so basically the IRS code says if you're going to issue a bond for, in this case, a 501c3, entity such as organizations such as Avery Coonley, you need um, to do a hearing. And that's that's the reason we do a hearing for this type of bond, for the conduit type of bond, as opposed to a bond where the village was uh, uh, directly liable for. And that's it with any, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. Are there any questions or comments from any members of the village council at this juncture with respect to the bond issuance? Hearing no questions from the council, I will ask if there are any statements or questions from any members of the public. Any members of the audience have any statements, comments, questions? Hearing none, we'll come back to any final questions or comments from members of the village council now that you've had time to think about it. Wish I could, I'd like to stomp them, but I can't. <laughs> there being none, thank you very much, Mr. Snyder. I will then uh, call for the adjournment of this public hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you. That being our only public hearing tonight, it brings us to item seven, which is our consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Are there any questions or comments from any members of the public with respect to any of the items on tonight's consent agenda? Any questions or comments from members of the village council with respect to any of the items on the consent agenda? Hearing none, may I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Neustadt? Aye. Commissioner Durkin? Aye. Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Olson? Aye. Commissioner Rankin? Aye. Commissioner Barnett? Aye. Mayor Tully? Aye. The consent agenda has been approved unanimously. That brings us to item eight, which is our active agenda. We have four items on our active agenda tonight. We'll begin with item 8A as an apple. Do I have a motion to adopt an ordinance amending stormwater utility fees for the year 2014? Mayor Tully, I move to adopt an ordinance amending stormwater utility fees for 2014 as presented. Second. Are there any questions or comments from any members of the audience with respect to this item? Seeing none, questions or comments from members of the council with respect to this item? Commissioner Olson. I think my views on this item are fairly clear. I'm opposed to this increase. I think there's been, we have additional uh, commentary and discussion on the utility and, and uh, look forward to having that. And I don't think it's appropriate at this time to have an increase and I'd ask my colleagues to oppose it. I do have a full statement. I'd ask unanimous consent that the full, my full statement be printed in the record and I've submitted that to the village clerk. Unless there's any objection to Commissioner Olson's statement being included in the record, it will be included in the record. Thank Other you, Mayor. Than, you're welcome. Thank you. I think, as you pointed out, I think everyone's position on this issue has been stated on multiple occasions. Other questions or comments at this time from any members of the Village Council on this item? Commissioner Rankin? I just wanted to mention um, our, at our last meeting that I had proposed um, possibly. Um, all right, I, excuse me, I had asked staff to present information about how the impact would be if taxes and properties were charged a, a lower rate than others. Um, I still am going to support the fee of six, uh, fee increase of 6.4% and just ask 
my colleagues that when we consider the cost share program that maybe we can also consider that option at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. We can certainly consider that and as well as other things at that time. Other questions or comments? Hearing no further questions or comments, may I have a roll call please on this item? Commissioner Neustadt? Aye. Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Olson? Nay. Commissioner Rankin? Aye. Commissioner Barnett? Nay. Commissioner Durkin? No. Mayor Tully? Aye. Matter passes four to three. That brings us to item 8B as in boy. We have a motion to adopt an ordinance amending water utility fees for 2014. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments from any members of the audience with respect to this item? Questions or comments from members of the council with respect to the water utility fees for 2014? Hearing none, I have a roll call, please. Commissioner Neustadt? Aye. Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Olson? Aye. Commissioner Rankin? Aye. Commissioner Barnett? Aye. Commissioner Durkin? Aye. Mayor Tully? Aye. That matter passes unanimously. Brings us to item 8C as in Charlie. Do I have a motion to adopt an ordinance that will rezone property located at 4245 Bel Air Lane from R2 single family residence to B3 general services and highway business? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments from members of the audience with respect to this rezoning? Any questions or comments from members of the Village Council with respect to this rezoning? Hearing none, may I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Barnett? Aye. Commissioner Durkin? Aye. Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Olson? Aye. Commissioner Rankin? Aye. Commissioner Neustadt? Aye. Mayor Tully? Aye. That matter passes unanimously. That brings us to our last active agenda item. 8D is in David. Do I have a motion to adopt an ordinance amending provisions concerning medical cannabis? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you, we have two seconds. Uh, any members Sorry. of the audience wish to question or comment on this item? Hearing none, questions or comments in the Village Council? Commissioner Barnett? Thanks, Mayor. I'm uh, opposed to this as written. I know and understand the reason that we're even into this subject. Thank you, Springfield. Um, but as it's written now, in my mind, it, uh, it places too much opportunity for such facilities to be in close proximity to what I believe are institutions or organizations or operations that our, our public generally probably believes are uh, more protected than this from, from this kind of activity. I know we've heard an awful lot over the last three or four years, certainly, about activities in downtown that are not totally dissimilar to this, and uh, so I prefer a far more uh, restrictive version of this, and so I will not be supporting tonight's. Uh, it lies in the definition of distance. So. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Olson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I just want to say I, I plan to support this, though I'm not happy about it. Um, as Commissioner Barnett, Barnett alluded to, this this state law is is, is not something that I uh, would have supported, uh, but that's out of our control. Um, but however, I will support this item tonight. I think that I am, I'm pleased to see that any institution would be required to come before this council for a special use permit. So I'm pleased by that. And, uh, and, and I would hope that we would uh, thoughtfully consider an, that item, uh, any proposal when it comes forward. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Other questions or comments from members of the council? Commissioner Rankin. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm also um, going to vote no on this ordinance. Um, I would have preferred that uh, recreational uses were included in uh, the grouping of um, Areas that uh, the cultiv not yeah excuse me the cultivations must be 2,500 feet and the distri distribution must be 2,500 feet. So um, I will be voting no. I uh, I understand that adding that would have reduced the amount of eligible parcels and could have been deemed in a unreasonable by the state. But um, I, I just don't think that it should be uh, located near recreational uses. So that's where I stand. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Other questions or comments from members of the council? Commissioner Durkin? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. You know, I'll be support I will not be supporting this 
not going to repeat what Commissioner Barnett Rankin had stated, but I, I think that with the maps that were provided, if we eliminated the recreational uh, areas uh, for such use, that it gave them plenty of opportunities to have a business in town. I think we're being too lenient by uh, supporting what staff's recommending, and I hope that uh, there'll be another one of us out there that will vote no on this. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Other questions or comments? Commissioner Jose. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, uh, too, share some of the concerns here in, in terms of where uh, I would like to see these uh, restricted to. That being said, I think the restrictions that we have uh, in this ordinance are sufficient. Uh, we're talking about 1,000 feet from any uh, school or church under state law. We're talking about 1,000 feet from any public park uh, as a result of uh, uh, an amendment that was brought forward and uh, considered by the plan Commission recommended to us. Uh, and I think those are, are good logical uh, extensions of what's going on in the state statute. Uh, I also think that, as uh, Commissioner Olson said, that the inclusion of a special use in this uh, gives us the, the flexibility that we need in order to be able to uh, you know, apply in a, a rational and thoughtful manner the ordinance that we have and uh, take into account some of the concerns uh, with regard to these, uh, these other private recreational uses. Uh, I, I'm also concerned that if we were to go in that direction, as has been suggested, that we'd be running the risk of costly litigation. And uh, that's something that, that I don't want to do. And uh, I think the restrictions that we have and the flexibility that they provide uh, are sufficient. I think they're reasonable, uh, both in general and under the statute. And uh, for those reasons, I'll be supporting it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Other questions or comments from members of the Council? Commissioner Newstat. We'll all weigh in on this one. I, I think that where we're at is a, a good starting point. And as has been said, we had to do something because this is not permitted or allowed in our zoning ordinance as it stands. So creating a special use and allowing us to put some encumbrances on it, uh, potential use already still allows us to look at individual petitions that may or may not come before us. I think we all hope that we don't have to even worry about this. Uh, our information says it could be up to 60 dispensing organizations in the state. Um, this is a good starting point for that. I will be supporting it because I think this is a good template for us to look at. And then if and when a uh, petition comes forward, we'll be able to determine its location and its, uh, its right in our village. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. And did I miss anyone? No. I, I don't think so. Um, I'll just make three quick points. Uh, number one has been pointed out, that why are we even addressing this? We have received some inquiries from residents. Why are you even talking about this subject? Well, we don't have a choice but to talk about the subject. Uh, in fact, we're being responsible for being proactive in talking about the subject because with the passage of the Compassionate Use of Medical Cannabis Pilot Program Act, we, we have to anticipate there may be potential requests and plan for them. And as anyone who's been looking at the media in recent months knows that all responsible communities are looking at this issue and planning for it and being proactive about it because uh, it's not a matter of choice, it's a matter of fact, and, and we're, we're dealing with it as a responsible community. So that's why we're even talking about it. Uh, number two, then the question is, how do we deal with it? And we need to do it in a reasonable and rational fashion rather than an arbitrary, capricious one. And uh, while obviously motions run high on this is issue and there are multiple different views, uh, I think that the way our staff has addressed it along with our plan commission, the recommend recommendations before us, which are considerably limited if, if one looks at um, uh, the language, but I understand that it's a spectrum and some would like to see it limited to uh, a further degree. I, I certainly understand that, uh, but, but it's about a balance within what's appropriate for our community. And I think what's been proposed uh, is, is on the rational and reasonable side and therefore uh, is appropriate. Um, we can see how this goes as time goes on and as indicated, it may not be something we need to deal with at all, we'll see. Uh, but we're being proactive and responsible in, in addressing it up front. Uh, and third, and again, it's important to recall, as has been mentioned, that there is a, a, a safety net here in the sense that this is being established as a special use. So it's not as though any of this can happen as of right. Um, someone would have to come before us and petition and go through our special use process. And so I think a lot of the concerns, a lot of the legitimate concerns have been expressed by my colleagues, I think can appropriately be addressed at that point in time. And again, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer on any of this, uh, but I think as it's been proposed, it's, uh, it's reasonable and rational and provides appropriate protections and demonstrates that the village is being responsible and proactive uh, and we still have an opportunity to weigh in and um, require additional um, restrictions, if not uh, when we have something that's more concrete, if we have something that's more concrete before us down the road. 
If there are no further questions or comments, then I will ask for a roll call on this item, please. Commissioner Neustadt? Aye. Commissioner Olson? Aye. Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Rankin? Nay. Commissioner Barnett? Nay. Commissioner Durkin? <coughs> no. Mayor Tully? Aye. The matter passes four to three. That brings us to the end of our active agenda and to item nine on our agenda, which is our first reading, or the workshop portion of our meeting where we entertain items for discussion and presentation purposes only uh, and potential action at a later point in time, but we'll not be voting on it tonight. As is customary, these items are turned over to village staff for presentation. We have one item on our first reading or workshop agenda tonight. And as I mentioned, I'll turn it over to village staff. It looks like Mr. Dave Reiner will be presenting on this, so I will short circuit Mr. Fieldman and go right to the man with the plan. Good evening. I don't know if it's good to have my boss short circuit here. Um, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. A resolution for a preliminary plat of subdivision has been prepared to subdivide the property at 7143 Dunham Road into three new lots, including uh, an exception to allow lot two to be 120.35 feet deep instead of the minimum required 140. Uh, and we are looking for approval on the December 10th agenda uh, per the Plan Commission's unanimous recommendation. Plan Commission discussed this property at its October 28th meeting and found that uh, it met the proposed that the proposed subdivision is consistent with the trend of development, uh, that it meets the requirements for the subdivision and zoning ordinances, and uh, lastly, that the requested exception meets the standards for, for approval per section 20.602 of the subdivision ordinance. Uh, normally, I start with a, uh, a location map. I, I, I wanted to quickly just reintroduce people to the preliminary plat concept because it's not something that we often do more likely or more typically we go straight to final plat and a development plan and things like that but this is a, a kind of a initial smaller step um, and really a preliminary plat um, features uh, provides site features like topography and ponds uh, as is included here uh, it includes the layout and dimensions of lots of streets street rights of way uh, it may include placements of sidewalks, utilities, easements, things like that. Uh, in some places, in fact, this is such a preliminary step that uh, staff simply reviews this material. There's no hearing. That's not the case here. We had a public hearing uh, through the Plan Commission, and now it's uh, coming before you. Uh, but once approved, in any case, a final plat uh, needs approval. Uh, that would come before this council and Plan Commission, for that matter. Uh, a lot more detailed plans, a recordable survey, development plans, uh, hearings, et cetera, those are all part of that second uh, uh, set of steps as well. So why would anybody even want to do this? Well, to test the appropriateness of their concept, uh, the acceptability of it, uh, and the fit, uh, the fit physically and the, that fit with the character of the community and the neighborhood. So given this location, we thought that it probably made sense to do this. This is a kind of a transitional uh, area between commercial use and a busy street and a residential, uh, single family residential. It seemed like the way to go. Now I'll get to the uh, location map. And that's the location that we're looking at. Um, we have the curve in Lamont Road here. There's Dunham. And this is all north of um, 75th. We can zoom in and take a look at the zoning. Um, you'll see just really two colors here. R5A is shown in brown, uh, really everything uh, north and west of uh, Lamont here. And the area that we're looking at is this almost a rectangle um, in that location. Um, we'll take a look at the aerial there, um, and you get a sense of the property. Uh, there's one uh, house now located on the property. That is what we're looking at. Um, I wanted to point out in this graphic, this is not what they're proposing. I wanted to point out um, what could be done without the subdivision. Uh, in fact, under R5A, townhouses could be built at a certain density, and they could be one large series of townhouses. This example shows one that's 14 units long. Uh, it fits. You might be able to squeeze another one on there, 15 perhaps. Um, but that could be done uh, pretty much by right. 
Uh, it's R5A. This is townhouse development that, we're, that I'm showing here. And it really would uh, provide a rather intimidating barrier, I think, uh, to the area. And, and, um, uh, and I'll show you, by contrast, what's being proposed. Um, the blue line um, shows the, um, what ultimately would remain as far as uh, a, the total th number of properties, the three properties. And we'll just roll in the uh, two lines there that are being added uh, as part of the subdivision. Um, so we've got one here and we've got one that kind of squares off um, the back end of the development. And then uh, I do want to point out, because I'm going to refer to this later, we've got this kind of notch here that results. That is a portion that is acquired by the developer and then uh, becomes uh, dedicated via the, you know, as right-of-way um, for Crystal Avenue. Um, we'll touch on that in a bit. So we've overlaid the plan. You've got the highlighted blue property lines here. And um, uh, in that kind of notch area, with the subdivision uh, process, we now have authority under Chapter 20 in the Municipal Code, this subdivision ordinance, to proceed with um, uh, making some requests, uh, not just requests, but requirements. So we've got things that we wanted to talk about, like uh, Crystal Avenue. Uh, other things that are pretty normal, I think, for all of us who deal with this, sidewalks, uh, stormwater improvements, things like that. It's all shown um, here. It's a little bit hard to see, but, the, but it is there. And the, um, then I highlighted the, um, the buildings that are proposed. So it's a six-unit building, four-unit building, and a two-unit building. So it really kind of steps down in intensity as you go farther into uh, the um, development further east along Crystal. Uh, Avenue, and I think that's something important to keep in mind. Um, again, we're going from something that would be allowed like this to something that is a, a little bit more broken up because of the um, uh, three buildings, three smaller buildings versus one large uh, obstacle uh, type building. Also, reducing the number of units here from uh, what could be allowed, as many as 16 uh, in some configuration, uh, that's being reduced down to 12. That's, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, what's being proposed by the uh, developer here. Um, it's, we, we think that it's more compatible with the single family developments to the north and to the west. Uh, it's certainly an area, again, uh, of transitional use from a busy roadway and commercial areas uh, to the south and to the uh, southeast. Um, but you can see that it's much more open than that um, uh, barrier uh, style 14 unit example that I pro that I uh, not proposed I provided I'm not proposing that I'm gonna be clear um, so the related actions to all of this uh, really are represented here we're asking uh, the developers asking for the one exception it's the north south dimension for the middle lot uh, being reduced from 140 feet down to 120.35 feet we've got um, also uh, well and that's the result of Crystal Avenue uh, being widened, the street itself uh, from uh, uh, 21 feet to 29 feet, but uh, with, uh, that is contained within the right-of-way, uh, which is currently 35 feet. That would be expanded to 70 feet. That's that notch that I uh, highlighted earlier. Uh, and then um, we would have a right-of-way dedication with that. Uh, it would also include installation of a five-foot-wide sidewalk running east-west along the site. Uh, there's payment in lieu of parkway trees. These are all normal things that you would see, uh, and park and school donations. Um, so uh, this is essentially what's being proposed. Um, the buildings are really just highlighted for you. With the question before us are the blue lines. Um, uh, but the items that did come up at Plan Commission are, are the ones that typically come up, in this case, uh, traffic impacts really been minimized. Stormwater and public safety improvements uh, are being made. Uh, there's a high price point uh, proposed uh, for the uh, units, and that uh, generally helps to preserve property values in the area. Uh, the plan commission found that it was in compliance with the comprehensive plan with regard to transitional uses and the uh, diversified housing stock goals that are part of uh, the comprehensive plan. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Dave Reiner. I will first ask if there are any questions of any members of the audience with respect to this item before we inquire of members of the Village Council. Yes, there is. 
And, and please, uh, the protocol is to come down to the podium. Please give us your name and address, and we would welcome hearing from you. Good evening. Good evening, Council. My name is Chester Tom. My address is 7205 Matthias Road. Basically, I just want to talk about some concerns and issues with the preliminary proposal and how it's laid out. I've overlaid in red basically the existing layout of single family homes. All these are the existing family homes here right now. Um, they call it Dunham Street Development or the current address of the subject property is Dunham Street. Dunham Street is right here and that's because the existing driveway is from Dunham. On the property right now, single family home. All these single family homes, Matthias single family home. So basically the affected area is more Crystal Avenue and Matthias Road. The proposal has dense housing right in the area of single family homes. And not only that, this uh, townhouse is gonna be directly right next door to an already established single family home. Talk about planning. All the homes in the immediate area of Crystal, Dunham, Stanford to the north, they're all single family homes and they're all built in the same era of the late 90s and in the 2000 time frame. Basically, typical village planning would not have mixed use home zoning where multifamily housing is in direct area of already established single family housing. I'm asking that the village has a responsibility and the right to preserve good planning. Unsound planning adversely affects the whole community. It doesn't just affect us on Crystal, Matthias, Dunham, and Stanford. Basically, if we have haphazard planning, that basically makes a town, an area, less desirable. Okay, here's the, uh, an overview of Google Maps. I tried to highlight the existing single family homes here and basically overlay the development. This is actually an earlier plan that we got from the developer on a, a get to know you. Because at first it was gonna be a four, six, and a two. Now my understanding is it's a six, four, and a two. But uh, either way, it's in direct line of the single family homes. And especially this one is literally right next door to existing single family homes. You've seen this slide uh, that the commissioner showed before, but I wanted to show it because everything in red here, including the existing property, all single family homes. Now, I hear a lot about the comprehensive plan and this proposal meeting the comprehensive plan, but I looked at the comprehensive plan and I got this and I quote, and this talks about residential uses for the, for the future land use plan and specifically single family detached residential as opposed to a single family attached, uh, which is a townhome. Single family detached residential on page 27 of the comprehensive plan, quote, since its incorporation in 1873, Downers Grove has developed predominantly as a residential community, nearly 80% of which is single family and owner occupied. The land use plan recommends that single family residential neighborhoods continue to be located throughout the village. I also got this from the comprehensive plan and it talks about the plan use, residential plan use of single family detached homes. I kind of blew this up uh, over here. Here's Lamont, Dunham. This is the area that we're talking about. So even in the comprehensive plan, it is showing specifically single family detached for this area. You may see this area that's in orange. That is a townhome area that is, is there, and that is a single family attached uh, community. So even our comprehensive plan is showing this area clearly single family detached home. 
this is kind of dark, but uh, I got this from Google Maps. And somebody mentioned that, well, there's some townhomes in the area to the east. And there is. There's, this is a townhome development over here. This is the subject property. This is all the homes, single family homes built in the same time frame. And these are remaining single family homes. Typical um, transition would be like this. A townhome subdivision, basically they've got their own entrance. Own entrance off of here. And then they'll so have a transition. A transition between multifamily and single family. And this transition is such that the backyards of these townhomes match up with the backyards of here. However, when you look from here, nobody even knows that the townhomes are right here because that is a natural transition from a townhome area to single family home. What is proposed here, that's not the case. They're using this drive, actually from here, they're using this drive to, to have basically townhomes right on top of the existing, already established um, single family homes. Other issues besides just good planning, safety. Existing Crystal Avenue, it's served by a single point ingress and egress. There is no additional outlet. There's currently no cul-de-sac on that route either. And plus, we're going to add, propose another 12 uh, homes there with double uh, garages. Currently, the garbage trucks, snow plows, school bus, other large vehicles, they actually back into Crystal from Dunham. Um, Dunham Road, you know, Dunham Road also has dedicated bike lanes, which presents additional concerns to vehicles backing out onto Dunham. I can tell you this, the snow plow, he, he heads in, takes care of the snow, and then he backs back all the way out. Garbage trucks, they start out, they actually back in from Dunham all the way, and then come out and head out uh, that way. The additional uh, density, uh, without a cul-de-sac is going to be a safety issue. <coughs> Other safety concerns. Uh, potential issues with emergency vehicles such as fire trucks and ambulances. How do they turn around? It's a very narrow road there. There's no cul-de-sac and the proposal does not show any cul-de-sac either. How do we absorb 24 additional vehicles into an area that currently only has eight single family homes, six on Crystal and two on Matthias. Again, I say the proposal does not include provisions or space for a cul-de-sac. And Stanford Avenue to the north, that has a cul-de-sac. I'm stating, hey, use this as the model. You can actually probably see it from this view here. This is Stanford. So all these homes are built in the same time. Stanford is also a single point entry from Dunham. You can see where it curves over here, and then you've got this cul-de-sac right here in the sweeping curve. This narrow street, right angle, no cul-de-sac, you can't turn around. Okay, here's a view from Dunham into, um, into Crystal. This is the existing I know some of it may be only a half a foot, but it's not 21 feet. Currently, it's 20 and a half feet uh, as measured from curb to curb. Um, again, just highlighting that it is narrow, no cul-de-sac. You have to back in or out of crystal. Showing no outlet here. This is the subject property over here. Here's the dedicated bike lane right here where it does present a hazard for trucks, large vehicles, UPS, backing in or backing onto Dunham over here. This curve here is also a real tight radius. It's a tight radius where right now, basically if a car is here coming out and a car is coming in, turning in, they can't turn in. They can't turn because of this tight radius until this car clears to allow the car coming in to make entry into Crystal. Okay, here's Matthias Road. This is showing 30 feet curb 
to curve. Okay, this is the view from, um, from Dunham. This is Stanford. This is the street directly north. You can see where this curve is, have, has a sweeping radius which promotes a lot safer traffic flow into a single point uh, street over here. Stanford also is a full 30 feet curve to curve as well. Again, well, you can also see the generous setback uh, from here too. And again, all these are single family homes built in the late 90s to 2000 period. What are some alternatives? You know what? The area is all single family homes. One of the alternatives is to develop property into single family homes. The six unit townhouse, that's too imposing. Consider separating that into smaller or fewer units. A four and a two, you got the six. The proposed townhouse at the east end, basically that has zero transition from the existing single family home. We talk about transition area, well guess what? That has zero transition area because it's literally gonna be right next door. Consider a single family home on lot three. Okay, this is also a view that a lot of people, well you may see this a lot and don't even realize that, hey, you know if there's a single family home here. This is a view of the subject property from the south, I'm looking north. So basically I'm at Lamont Road um, and Dunham. It's tough to see, and maybe you can see it on, on your handout, but the existing single family home, that's right there uh, in, in the green. Okay, welcome to Downers Road. Issues to address for any development. You gotta consider the established surroundings and make sure that they're consistent with the existing neighborhood character. You know, I've read in the pamphlet and I've been told multiple times that, you know what, the current zoning classification, it allows for building one building with 14 units. But a compromise has been struck to break it down into a six, a four, and a two. My contention is it's still not enough of a compromise. Widen the road to 30 feet, similar to Matthias in Stanford. Widen the road helps with the safety portion, especially when there is no cul-de-sac. What else uh, an issue? Include an area for a properly designed cul-de-sac. Also properly size that entryway onto crystal to reduce any traffic flow issues. I'm going to state that this is a non-typical layout because it's only a single point ingress and egress. A non-typical layout warrants review of minimum requirements. You know, after the, um, the public hearing, uh, I asked the, the plan staff, hey, you know, what does it take to make that road 30 feet as opposed to, and actually the, the drawing shows 27 feet proposed. What does it take to go to 30 feet because the roads right next to it and adjoining it are 30 feet? Here's the answer that I got. Well, the minimum requirement is 29 feet. If we ask him to do 30 feet, we have to, do, we have to ask others to do 30 feet. That's not enough of a compromise, especially for a non-typical layout. I see a lot of the plan commission showing aerial views. Sometimes the aerial view doesn't show you the character of the area like a street view. I took this photo of the single family homes that are on Crystal. I'm standing, I'm standing on the subject property looking at the existing single family homes. You know what, the proposal is not consistent with the character of the area. When we went to the, um, the info session by the developer, they stated, you know, they've got some townhomes that they built in Burr Ridge. So we actually looked at one of the townhomes over here, and this is an actual photo 
of one of the townhomes uh, in Burr Ridge. Compare and contrast this. This is a six uh, unit versus this. No way is that in the character of the neighborhood. These are the other, other, other two homes on Matthias. I'm on Crystal looking east. A lot of the contention is, hey, there's already townhomes on the east. I'm on Crystal, I'm looking east. I don't see any townhomes there. These are our single family homes right there, established, established, all at the same time. And guess what? We're gonna put the lot three townhouse literally right next door with zero transition. That's what's proposed. I think you uh, saw this before. Here's the area, and you can see the cul-de-sac here on, uh, on Stanford. No cul-de-sac currently, and no cul-de-sac proposed. I see it as, I've got this area of land, this 2.2 acres, I'm gonna try to fit as much building as possible as I can, and I'm not really considering too much of the surrounding neighborhood. Here's the planning staff report from the 1028 public hearing, because there's an exception being asked for. This is some of the criteria that's used to grant the exception, stating that this criteria has been met. Some of these uh, criteria, is the exception consistent with the trend in, or development in the area and the surrounding uses? The answer was, yes, it's met. I would challenge that, no, it's not met. The characteristics of the property which support granting of the exception, met. Is the exception in conformance with the general plan and spirit of the subdivision or ordinance, met. Whether the exception will alter the consistent or, or be consistent with the essential character of the locality, met. Again, I question if the townhouse proposal truly meets the above criteria for granting the exception. Can you show the video, Mike? I've just got a 360 video where I'm standing on crystal so you can kind of see the area. The, the um, subject property is to the left. Again, all single family homes. I'm standing at uh, Crystal. This is Matthias. This is where proposed lot three townhome. This is proposed the four unit townhome. This is the proposed the six unit townhome over here as well. Thank you. The, um, the development proposal as is needs more work. Don't approve it as is. If you allow this, what else would you allow? We talk about compromise. Again, they keep on bringing up hey, we could have put a 14 unit there, but I almost felt like they think that they're doing us a favor by putting a six, a four, and a two. It's not enough of a compromise for the six, four, and two. Break it down into more units. You know, basically what one configuration is, we said break down the six unit, break it down into smaller. You know, you can make it into a four, four, two, and a one. A four, four, two, and a one, actually that addresses a lot of the issues. It's only a reduction in units by one. Right now they're asking for 12, four, four, two, and one gives you 11. The four and two, that's broken down so it's not a big six unit. The one at the end, that would be right next door, so that would be a single family home, right next door to single family home. To me, that seems a lot more reasonable. Yeah, it's a reduction by one unit to the developer, but that one unit or that single family at the end, that may also give us some room for a proper, uh, for a proper cul-de-sac as well. 
Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Tom. Appreciate your presentation and your comments. And I want to compliment you on your organization. A lot of the materials that you put into that obviously reflects a great deal of work on your part. You. And we appreciate that. Thank you. Other questions or comments from members of the audience with respect to this item? And, and obviously, we completely suspended the five minute rule. <laughs> It was, it was no that's all right it was I, I assume you speak on behalf of the whole neighborhood so it's entirely appropriate good evening or maybe not we'll find out uh, he generally does <laughs> <laughs> my name is Steve Auerhammer I live at 1160 Crystal Avenue um, I'm not going to I'm gonna try to not be too redundant on some of the things that the Chester has talked about here but there's a couple of things that I do want to highlight um, I don't think that we're necessarily opposed to the issue of this property being subdivided and and that's kind of what we ran into when we came before the Planning Commission that the only the only real question on the table is whether or not this property could be subdivided and um, and certainly we prefer that scenario over the the one building 14 to 16 unit sort of development and so I, I want to be clear that that's not what we're opposed to it's probably more in opposition to the zoning uh, of this area um, being a zone for townhome development, uh, especially after the majority of this specific area was built into single family detached uh, residences back in the late 90s. Um, probably at the time it would have been prudent to go back and revisit the zoning of that entire area and, and plan for it at that time. Um, but that's that's neither here nor there at this point. And so um, we just say that just for your full consideration there. Um, the other things that I, I want to highlight is the, the single access um, off of Dunham. Uh, it, it really is more of an issue than, than it might appear. Uh, being in close proximity to the uh, intersection of Dunham and Lamont Road, there's a lot of traffic that will come in, decide that they didn't want to turn on Dunham. The first street they come to is Crystal. They'll come in there. They'll look to turn around somewhere, realize that that's a dead end. And, and so really, I would say that, that close to 50% of the traffic that we see on Crystal is inadvertent traffic in spite of the no outlet sign that's posted at the entrance. And so um, although there's talk of uh, developing the street uh, with a hammerhead at the end instead of a cul-de-sac and these sorts of things. It's still uh, that, that entire single uh, entrance and, and egress is, is a problem. And I think with the development of, of 12 townhomes in this area, it's just gonna make it that much worse. Um, so, so that's a real concern there. Um, I wanna highlight uh, the statements that, that are, are are basically saying that this development is consistent <coughs> with uh, the, the existing character of the neighborhood. Uh, that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, you know, the, the property that we're talking about is actually pretty unique. Um, it's, a, it's a neat property uh, that transitions from the green space that's owned by the village immediately to the south there. And probably uh, the right thing to do with it would be to somehow preserve that as a green space. Um, it, it, it certainly could be cleaned up. It certainly could be um, improved to some extent, but, but it really is kind of a unique property and a, a really neat transition from the mass of retail and, and commercial developments there to the south to the residential to the north. So I, I throw that out there for a consideration. Finally, a, a statement, uh, the developer you know, has, has claimed that they plan to uh, have a price point of about $500,000 on these things. Um, with a little bit of research, the developer has a very poor track record of meeting their price points. Um, some developments that they had in Burr Ridge uh, actually didn't even, they, they came to within 60 to 70 percent of meeting their price point, their initial price point on that. So I just, I, I want to make that point because it is a concern to the people that are in the neighborhood that the development of these townhomes and then their eventual selling price will significantly affect our home values in the area. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here and appreciate your comments. Other questions or comments from members of the audience with respect to this workshop item?
Good evening. Welcome. Hi. My name is Don Harkins. I live at 1130 Crystal Avenue with my wife, Laura Lai. We live right across the street from Chester and Jennifer, and Steve lives just down the road. They were very thorough, and I don't have anything really to add to that thorough presentation, except to uh, express uh, our unity in the eight single-family homes that uh, we've gotten to know each other pretty well just by talking about the townhouses coming across the street. And I want to let you know that uh, none of the eight single-family homes do oppose. I mean, we're all against townhomes being across the street, the R5 zoning doesn't match our single family homes. And the fact that really the single family homes go all the way up to 71st Street, and that's all R5 zoning is also a concern for the future. And we want to be careful to see what happens potentially with other property that's just north of us. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harkins. Other questions or comments from members of the audience? Please, ma'am, come on down. Good evening, welcome. Good, good evening, uh, I'm Carol Wong. I reside uh, at uh, 1170 uh, 70 Crystal Avenue. And um, you know, after the last uh, uh, meeting with the Planning Commission, I was told, I talked to the, a couple of the members after, uh, after the meeting, and I was told that the economic concern is not an issue that but you know hearing all every all you know all the information being presented then uh, you know um, the builder will contribute 30 plus some thousand dollar to the village school district and I and I feel that this is a economic concern you know to all of us because you are putting you know um, I think it you trying to comfort us that you will put you know, less unit, you know, um, you know, 12 unit, but you have to see that those uh, houses, they've been built in Burr Ridge. And, uh, you know, my heart, you know, almost broken because I, uh, when we bought the house, you know, uh, that it's a, you know, it's a one single family home and then facing Dunnan Street. And then now you are going to put 12 units you know, 24 carts at least, and facing our street. And all the residents are, you know, against this, but then the planning commission telling us, this is not an economic concern. Then I went home and asked everyone, then what is the concern? Because, you know, 26 years ago, I choose to live in Downers Grove instead of Naperville. And because I feel that, that this is, you know, where I want to raise my kid and have a family. And but it turned out this is, you know, you are you you don't you will make a decision just based on economics, you know, because of this. Uh, the the I ask myself, you know, why then if we are all belong to the same zoning, then why don't why you know the builder did not put all the townhouses in our you know, in our, on our street. I think probably back in the 2000 or 19, in the 1990, you know, building single family home will make them, you know, more money. Now it's the, you know, you are b trying to build, you know, a town, those town home claim to be, you know, 500,000 and plus. And then, then what's, the, what's the issue here? You know, because th this way it can make more money. You know, I think while making, you know, bringing, you know, revenue to this, you know, city is a very important thing. But please do consider, you know, are these long standing residents here, we are faithfully pay, paying all the taxes when even our property, you know, value went downhill so badly, we never try to claim any tax credit back. And I think, you know, I think, you, you should listen to all of us and then give, give us the, this consideration. And I, I don't know what to say anymore. And I was shocked, you know, the way the planning committee, you know, decided vote for the decision. And 
to me, it's very simple. I'm an accountant. I listen to somebody else. I listen to all the experts. I call my realtor, you know, the, the realtor I know for 20 some years. I call them and then they told me it's not a good proposal. It is not. It's better to go with the single family home. So this, this issue to me is you rob Peter to pay Paul. So this, the builder only pay four hundred some thousand dollar to buy this property and going to build twelve town home, town home. You know, I don't think that justify and you know to make us sacrifice. I don't think that this is the right issue. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Wong. Thank you for coming and thank you for sharing your views. Good evening, welcome. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, my name is Hao Wang. I'm uh, living from 1170 Crystal Avenue. Um, so I just want to add a few more points. That is, uh, my main concern is uh, af after adding those uh, 12 more units, the traffic on Crystal Avenue will be uh, a lot worse. Right now, we have uh, six houses on Crystal and two more on Mes Messiah. So every house, we basically have, uh, uh, all the house on Crystal Avenue has two uh, double car garage. So now we added 12 more units, and every unit will come with a two car garage. So that will be immediately 24 car. That's the first question. So the analysis on this uh, vehicle traffic, and by saying that adding 12 units is identical to six single family uh, house, they quote uh, per institute for traffic engineering study, so I think this study, I really cannot understand this uh, traffic study. When you have six single house, you most likely you will have a 12 garage. You will have, a, um, uh, each one has, a, um, so there will be 12 more car. But by adding 12 units, there will be 24 car. So I think we, we should study this uh, mass carefully. And the second proposal is uh, they put in this uh, so-called hammerhead uh, turn. So hammerhead turn, I believe the way it will work, it's uh, there uh, cannot be any car parked on their own driveway. So there are several end units toward the uh, hammerhead in order for a big fire engine to back in, go in and out or any other big vehicle to come out. There should be very strict uh, zoning. Uh, along the street, there will be many uh, spots that should be a dead end. There should not be, should not allow any car parking. So in other words, uh, and also by their 12 unit de uh, design. Basically, the, uh, the street on the uh, apartment side or the condo side would, be, would not be allowed for parking any additional car on the street. Most of the car in Donald's Road, you can allow park on the left, on the right, and uh, so when the gas come, there's no issue. But however, I can see with uh, uh, this uh, uh, minimum standard, 25, uh, 25 feet, and, the, uh, um, and also one side, but that uh, by default, you, you cannot park any additional uh, gas vehicle. So they will be always on the, uh, the single house side. In addition, I noticed the language they put in, in, the, uh, in this uh, final proposal. They said they want to meet the minimum width of 29 feet and then back, uh, back of curb to back of curb. My understanding is then there will be, you cut out six inch from both sides, then there will be only 28, uh, 28 feet left. So it seems to me this is trying to go for the, the uh, minimum and the minimum standard. I will, see, I will foresee there are gonna be uh, a lot of traffic issue by this uh, proposal. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Wong. Thank you for being here tonight. Other questions or comments from members of the audience with respect to this item? Again, it's a workshop, so we're not making any decisions tonight. There'll be opportunity for further communication. I will just please, Mr. Tom. Hold thirty seconds. <laughs> I asked this uh, during the, um, the public hearing, but the cul-de-sac. Uh, I never did get, a, get an answer. Who actually does decide on a cul-de-sac? Is it the village or the developer? And I still don't know who decides. Thank you. I'm going to hazard the guesses that that's up to us, not the developer. And I'm, I'm seeing heads nodding that that is the answer. Thank you. 
Uh, with that, then, I will ask for questions or comments at this juncture from members of the Village Council. Questions or comments from members of the Village Council? Commissioner Barnett. Thanks, Mayor. Um, some stuff that's come to my mind through tonight it doesn't necessarily need to be answered this evening. Um, the existing, I guess I'd I need a better understanding. I'm sure, Tom, you went through it, and I just want to make sure I totally understand it. What what is allowed today with the lot size that it is and the zoning that it is if, if someone were to want to do something without having to seek any particular permission or exceptions or anything like that what is that what does that look like um, is that I, this that's the big long 14 unit building well it, it, when i um, placed a 14 unit structure on that single lot at that point, um, that assumed the same sized units. You could fit probably 16 units if they were smaller and, and, and cheaper. But um, that's what would be allowed today under the R5A zoning. Under the R5A with whatever setbacks are required and, uh, and bulk density kinds of things in terms of lot size, that's what would be allowed. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right, and all of the setbacks, um, and again, we're only dealing with the uh, subdivision issue, but the setbacks, as considered, um, uh, are all being met on, under the uh, what we assume will be the proposal in the future. Except for that one, right? There was a lot. Well, oh, that's a that's a lot depth. Lot depth. Issue. Is it was it an easement question? Exception. Yeah, so due to the right of way. To the right uh, of way. Not for easement, widening okay. the road and and, uh, and the uh, right of way for the Crystal right. Avenue. So the, the, is the purpose of seeking, I mean, this is probably not right for you to be able to answer, but the purpose of seeking the subdivision, an attempt at, you know, some sort of a, uh, I keep putting the word compromise, or is it an attempt at what they believe they can sell, or is it just that something they want to do and we don't know why? What, what is the purpose of the subdivision request? You know, they probably have a whole set of their own reasons, but typically you see a preliminary plat when there are some questions about just how do we fit um, units on properties, housing on properties, buildings on properties uh, in general, um, what would be the impacts of easements, uh, the right of way, how do we, you know, really how do we fit it all? And when they originally came um, to us and started these discussions, they actually did have more units proposed. And through this process, they've already learned that they could not achieve or, or maximize the uh, uh, number of units as they, I think, originally had, had hoped. So this is, a, this is almost a process that we go through typically with just staff and a developer before they ever move on to final um, uh, plats of subdivision and, and development plans. And that's typically what you guys all see um, is that uh, more advanced, more mature stage. This is. Um, uh, something very early. It's a, it's a sense. To, it's an idea for them to figure out how things are going to fit, what they can do legally, and in fact, uh, what they're proposing. Uh, really, everything meets other than the lot depth issue for the one lot, which is again uh, because of the right of way that they're dedicating. What um, the the development, and I apologize, I don't remember the street name, but the one that's north and east a little bit. It has an access off of Lamont Road or Main Street. It's a multi... Oh, sure, right. Pinewood or something. Right, exactly. Um, what's the density of that compared to what's being proposed? That'd be something I'd be interested yeah, I'd in. I'd have to get back to yeah. you. Yeah. That's significantly more dense, but I'd, we'll get back to you with that number. And then with with the request for an exception, what? how much latitude do we have um, in terms of... Uh, asking, insisting, pick your choice of words, that certain things be done from a design or a plat or a layout standpoint. Is it limited to that single parcel? Is it, do we have, and how much, you know, again, don't have to answer this right this moment from the podium, but I'd like to have a better understanding of how much uh, flexibility we have in, in sort of requesting certain design attributes, features, when that exception is being requested. And then the last thing is the um, 
this is only the, the I guess I'm still concerned still not concerned still just don't understand what the reason for the subdivision I get the preliminary plat idea and the idea of trying to figure out what's going to fit but what's the reasoning behind the subdivision request I'd like to understand that better the petitioners here tonight and could answer that question that'd, that'd be great I or not I mean, it doesn't have to be this moment but that's one of the things that I, I need to understand better is why the request for subdividing you could certainly treat it as one parcel and develop it as you suggested initially time and I understand the pre preliminary plat process but why the subdivision request so that's all I've got it, just one point of clarification if the developer chooses to develop on the existing lot of record then the subdivision code does not apply it's the subdivision code that requires the public improvements and so no street widening uh, and those types of things that are triggered by the subdivision code would be at play and the developer could choose to build without widening the road without putting in those types of improvements just wanted to add that for the to the distinction of one, one of the benefits of the fact that we have the request for a subdivision sure. on the tenant. it's just important I think that everybody understand what is available as an option kind of right um, just, okay thanks mayor Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Neustadt. Thank you, Mayor. I did take a ride uh, in this neighborhood today and saw it is a, it's an interesting couple of roads connected. There's not a lot of room there. We have a lot of roadways like that in Downers Grove. Uh, tonight we've heard from a couple of our residents about a couple options, a cul-de-sac and a hammerhead. Uh, just if we could get any f more information on that for, for our next meeting, if there's anything available for potential plans on that, that'd be helpful. If they're proposed or if that's going to be part of the, the proposed development or the request that we're going to ask you know. just just to clarify uh, more information on a hammerhead or the connection of a road what was the if there's going to be a hammerhead requested by the village or if it's going to be in the proposal by the developer it is the proposed hammerhead is in the part of the proposed okay good proposal. I'll look closer at the plans and they weren't the best ones we've seen but we'll get a little bit better I'll get a better look at it that's all I had Mayor. thank you other questions or comments? Commissioner Rankin? Could you, uh, excuse me. Oh, goodness. Could you bring up the picture? You had um, a pretty interesting graphic of the 14, if that was permitted, compared to the three. And I guess what I'm, my question is, is when you place that 14 on the property, I know that's you just rant, putting it there, but. Were you paying attention to what the setback requirements are? Because um, uh, it seems this seems. I mean, it, it, there yeah. was there was actually a lot of room to play north south. Because this uh, seems closer to the property. Right, and in fact, um, it's it is farther north because, uh, as Dave mentioned, uh, <coughs> the subdivision ordinance requirements only kick in when they're subdividing. Uh, under this example, none of that happens, so they can move. Uh, farther north on the property so a petitioner who wanted to do this would probably want to maximize backyard space and take advantage of that and not improve the road because that's less cost for them if they went this option and, okay and still have all the problems that we've heard about yeah all the concerns Correct. that we've heard about <clears throat> right yeah. okay and I think I'm not sure if I get what you were trying to come to a, a, an answer for is and I have the same question is the reason that the petitioner is considering the subdivision due to trying to work with this neighborhood a little bit better or is it a different reason I mean I don't know if that's what you were trying to get to the bottom of. well I just I was trying to sort of get the base point down clearly I mean the, the concerns that have been raised make all the sense in the world to me particularly when you consider some of sort of the street view aspects of it as opposed to just putting blocks on an aerial um, but that if, if they don't seek a subdivision we have very little control over anything and so I'm just trying to, to establish that baseline because we keep hearing the word compromise and there's clearly gonna have to be some going forward for anybody to end up happy in this deal uh, but it sort of hinges I think on the, on the subdivision of our ability to, to try and talk folks into compromise. Uh, representatives for the petitioner are here behind me, and I'll turn over the microphone. For, for the question, which is, why the subdivision route? <laughs> Good evening. If you please uh, give us your name and address. Welcome. Uh, my name is Anthony Piccararo. My address is 10 Cliff Road, uh, Road, Highland Park, Illinois. There are 
multiple um, reasons that we went with this method and a lot of it had to do with ordinances and I'm going to let my engineer Kevin here address some of those issues. Good evening, evening. Mayor, uh, members of the council. My name is Kevin Lewis. I'm with IG Consulting. Uh, my office is at 300 Marquardt Drive in Wheeling. And uh, we, th this is a, a combination of working with what the developer feels is within the market cap capability, what you want the product that he's looking to try and develop, along with what village staff has guided us in as it relates to what the ordinance would allow. So we too did what uh, uh, Tom had, had done and looked at what the maximum density would be, uh, whether it be 16 units. Uh, however, that didn't fit with the size model that he was looking to build a, a, a larger unit. Um, and uh, so th that's the reason that he can only fit 14 on there is that we did expand the size of the units that, uh, th that were ideal for what he believes is the market condition for here. Uh, and then the, 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 the idea of, of what would look good within the, within the property. Uh, as uh, Tom mentioned, we've been through um, dozens of iterations uh, internally as to what would work on this property, what would look better, what is a good transition and, and, and uh, balance between putting in 14 units in one big block and uh, part of the, uh, the analysis is, is that the, the setback from Dunham Road, which is obviously uh, fairly long due to the pond that's in there now, uh, th th there's no setback issue with that. It, it's that middle unit, the, the, what you're looking at now is that four unit. Uh, how does that setback get in, come into play when you subdivide and create that, that third lot? And it was with staff's suggestion that we looked at coming in with a, a subdivided plan. So um, this wasn't something that uh, we just randomly came up with. It was, it was through a, a, a dialogue that we got to this point that we, we, we felt collectively that this would be a good way to meet the demands that the developer is looking for, uh, existing R5A zoning for the property on what could be conceivably constructed on the property. And then how do we do that in working with staff in trying to meet some of the needs of the village? And of course, what they're looking for is something that's going to be marketable. And that's, that's a, a big consideration on our, from our standpoint as well. We want something that's going to meet with uh, the, the, the demands uh, that are out there. And so uh, I guess I'm trying to answer, uh, Commissioner Barnett, your, your, your question is to how did we come to this? Why did we come up with this plan? And uh, so ultimately what we're trying to do is to come up with something that will maintain that character. Uh, I, I would like to just jump out. This is a little bit beyond my purview, but I think it's relevant for you to understand that the pictures that you saw of the, uh, of, of the proposed development, or at least what was being put forth, are not the plans for what we have put forward for that, what the, the townhomes are going to, going to look like. It's a, a very different development, uh, I think a lot more in character for the neighborhood. Um, but really, maybe just as a, a point of correction, I wanted to point that out. But really, the, the, the issue that we're here today with is we can modify and come up with a 14-unit building that meets what our character, we believe, w within the style of the same uh, architecture that we're proposing and put it together and propose that, um, or actually just rather, rather than propose it, we would go and submit a building permit for it and go and construct it. Uh, but there, there seems to be perhaps a better solution. And that comes back to the idea of creating the three lots. And if it wasn't for the right-of-way dedication of creating that, giving the additional 35 feet, as <clears throat> Tom had indicated in the beginning, uh, we would have the 140 feet that would be necessary and so for, for that middle lot. So really what this is kind of boiling down to is it, does it make sense and it, does it meet the character and spirit of what we're trying to accomplish by granting that, that exception for that 120 plus feet 
instead of the 140 feet and, and still meet the, the, the intent and the character of what's being done here. We, we believe what we're proposing is a good development, in <coughs> fact, better than what might otherwise be constructed. And the, the, the variance does meet all of the requirements that the plan commission found that it did. So uh, I believe um, that hopefully answers your question. We'd certainly be available to answer any other questions if you have them. Well, thank you. As long as you're, I'm sorry. No, if you were to add, go ahead. No, I was, I was actually just going to see if you guys had any questions. I, I, I was going to ask the same thing. I said, as long as you're there, are there any other questions that any members of the council have of the petitioner? Uh, Commissioner uh, Rankin, you want to finish? Um, since you not of the petitioner, so we'll, we'll right. let Do you have a rendering of your facility? Or of the I don't proposed? have it on, on uh, PDF format or presentation, but I do have boards as well. Either that or I can look at them after the meeting. Okay. And then the square footage, that's only two questions, I'm rendering in this. What's the square footage of these? Of the units? Of the units themselves. I'm going to defer to him on that. That's fine. That's not my area. We're not voting anything tonight. <laughs> that's all. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Other, any other, as long as we have the petitioner up here, any questions of the petitioner? I'm not saying you can't ask any other questions. Commissioner Jose. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this might be better addressed to staff, but I'm, I'm going to take a shot here. Is there a reason why you went with a hammerhead versus a cul-de-sac? That's, that's a good question. It, it comes into the way that the street was currently constructed. Uh, <coughs> if, if you look at the big picture, if you zoom out a little bit, you'll note that Matthias basically dead ends into uh, no continuation. And uh, it, it, it picks up on the other side on, 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 yeah, that, uh, on Sanford. Uh, the, I, I believe, uh, I wasn't here when this was done, but I believe the intent was that Matthias would one day continue as a, as a uh, one road all the way through, that that was the ultimate plan. Uh, however, there was a holdout property and that didn't get constructed. This property too was probably likely in the same category as a holdout property. And this is a kind of completion of that. You'll note that the, the way the road arcs up at the top, uh, it's just off the screen there at the top, uh, is, is a very different sort of road than what we've been dealt with. So in, in a sense, it's, it's partly the cards that we were dealt. It's, it's how do we make that work uh, with, with the way the layout's already there, uh, the way the homes are there now. So um, it, it, and we had, uh, quite a lot of uh, discussion internally and with staff as to how to make that work, whether, uh, whether a hammerhead is, it would work or, or do we even need to do that at all? What, what's the best way to make that happen? Uh, we did communicate with uh, the um, uh, fire department on this. So um, that it, it, it goes to the, the underlying layout that, that we start with and anybody would start with. The, the term that's been used tonight is cul-de-sac. Really, what's more appropriate, I think, for that curve north of here is a bulb out. And a bulb out really is a way to design buildings to get additional units and driveway configurations to work. And that was the challenge on this side is where those two roads come together. How do you get the driveways to work in a manner that uh, can function if you're a homeowner there and also meet the safety concerns from the village? And so with that gap in Matthias Road there, eventually that road is planned to go through and there's no need for either a cul-de-sac or a bulb out. But the village still needs to make sure that adequate public safety is maintained. We've been working with this developer and they've agreed to a sprinkler system uh, within these residential units and we feel that that far surpasses the safety, uh, public safety elements that could be provided by just a bulb out or a cul-de-sac. So we get a hammerhead which allows our uh, public safety vehicles to turn around in most situations um, and public safety in terms of sprinklers that minimizes the likelihood and diminishes the likelihood that we'll be fighting a fire at these locations. So that's an example of some of the uh, latitude and negotiation that goes into requested subdivisions and uh, we'll continue to work with the developer on these types of issues as we move from preliminary plat to final plat and more importantly into the building permit issuance. This is more of a question for staff, Dave. <clears throat> Do we um, have a sense of whether uh, the widening of the road and the inclusion of the hammerhead will deal with the issues of 
snow plows and garbage trucks backing onto or uh, off of Crystal Avenue? Uh, no, uh, the solution to those types of issues uh, is in the connection of Matthias Road at some point in the future, as you can see from this gap here shown in this illustration. Now the creation of a hammerhead at the end of a widened Crystal Road or Crystal Avenue certainly uh, improves some aspect of that, but it is not its complete solution, no. Would a bulb out be? I don't, I'm not sure we could take a look at that. Thanks. I can talk a little bit about the discussions that we had with the petitioner regarding the bulb out and the impact on the single family residential property immediately to the north was pretty significant. And I, I wish we could go even farther north than what we've provided in the graphic. But if we could, you know, you can imagine drawing uh, kind of a bulb around that elbow at Matthias and Crystal, and you, and you start with that house that's right on the uh, intersection, right at the intersection, you really start to eat into that property. So while it's possible certainly to provide a bulb out there rather than the hammerhead, we felt the hammerhead had less of an impact provided the public safety turnaround requirements that our uh, the fire department uh, requested and um, it really was the better solution overall. Other questions or comments from the council? Uh, go ahead. Ms. Burnett. What would, have we given any thought to, or what would be the negative impacts of reducing the required, I guess in this case, rear setbacks as it relates to that village property? Um, just trying to think of what you might, opportunities you might have on the north side of the property for whatever you want to do in terms of trying to mitigate or adjust the, the you know, characteristic of the street as it, as the north side of the property is really in interesting or important one to the rest of the neighborhood, whereas that south end, um, whatever typical setbacks we might require, I, you know, I don't do we really care at the end of the day about a green space that's ours? I don't know. It might be another spot where there could be some back and forth that would be helpful to us. We could look at that as part of the uh, uh, continued discussions between preliminary and final. We could get some preliminary <coughs> information to you in the coming days. So I think I found it, but um, this property in question that's owned by the petitioner, um, when they purchased it, it was zoned this way, and it's been zoned this way for since the 80s. Is that right? I, you know, honestly, I don't know when that okay. zoning occurred. So, um, but it's had a history of being zoned that way before probably the other homes were built there. Okay. Thank you. Um, no, go right ahead. I, I did that? find the hammerhead. I think it's interesting. Sorry, I didn't blow it up far enough on the, on the uh, display here, but the hammerhead actually is on the subject property itself. So Correct. I think that adds to some of the, uh, the turnaround capabilities and some of the, again, the control that we have with the subdivision ordinance. So I, I appreciate the, the fact that that's in there. I think that knowing where we have put in hammerheads and talked about them in other roadways in our village looking at this image and of course having been out there today i think the main concern is an ambulance um, approaching a home on crystal or even one of these proposed townhomes being able to turn around and get out you know the engines they'll they'll get their way out but the ambulance and that fast response and exit off the property of the subject street would be uh, important so to hear that the fire department has been consulted and to see it a little bit closer imaged here, I, I appreciate that, Hammerhead. Thank you. Thank you. A couple of uh, observations or for the for the, uh, the the audience, and then I have a number of questions that I don't expect an answer necessarily tonight, but between now and next week. Uh, first, is is Commissioner Rankin pointed out in her question whether or not the zoning should be R5A or not is sort of besides the point because it is, has been for some time and was purchased in good faith by the property owner with that zoning designation. Uh, so it is what it is. Um, and obviously we're always faced with balancing property rights, um, 
people within reason should be allowed to do what they want with their property. We do have rules, and if people fit within the rules, then they sort of get to do what they want. No different than somebody wanting to put up a shed or a fence. Um, you know, we try to balance the, the needs of the community with the property rights of the owners. We are a, obviously a built-out community, so we don't have greenfield opportunities where we can sort of start with a blank slate. We often are faced with uh, situations where we're dealing with infill development or redevelopment. Uh, it's one of the things that we uh, face all the time and, and often are, you know, whatever it is that's different is going to be a change from what's been there because of the nature of our built-out community. And our, our, we challenge our staff in many different environments to try to work with whomever it is that's requesting something, whether it's a resident, a developer, or business, uh, to try to get to a solution where it's uh, a yes, again, within reason and within what the rules and, and, and are. So it doesn't surprise me at all that there's been an ongoing dialogue about, okay, what can be done and what would make sense and what are the options. That's something that we challenge our staff to do with, with anyone that comes to the village seeking an inquiry with respect to what they can or can't do. Um, so that doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, the, the last observation is, uh, although it's suggested that if the preliminary description of what is proposed here went through, it would result in about $34,000 worth of uh, contributions to the park district and the two school districts, I just want to point out, I think that's really going to be a material factor in anyone's decision here tonight. I suspect that's what the plan commission meant when the, I don't know what those people meant, but I suspect that they were probably indicating that was not a material factor in, in their decision, but rather, um, is this something that meets with our, our rules and regulations? Uh, that's, that's really the question. So with that, uh, I do have some questions. One is, uh, and I think that I'm clear on this, the, the only exception that's being requested is the 35 foot reduction with respect to the lot depth on lot number, on proposed lot number two. Correct. And that's being driven by the fact that we have a right of way with requirements. The village is basically mandating that exception. Correct. It's not something that if someone's trying to shoehorn something in. It's where we're basically asking for it, and therefore the exception is required. That's the only exception. Correct. Okay. Then I also have some questions about the preliminary plat process, because as you mentioned, this is not something that we see very often, and this may be something that uh, our village attorney can educate me on at some point in time. Well, but I, I note that the process includes the, uh, the village council determining appropriateness. And you know me, I'm going to ask the question of by what criteria do we determine appropriateness? Um, I, I don't see any references to any part of our code that would provide factors or things to consider, though this is a discretionary yes. determination. Absolutely. Sort of like reasonable. Yes. And fair. <laughs> okay. Appropriate. Appropriate. Is Appropriate the mess is the word. Got gotcha. you. Okay. So there's there's little guidance provided there with respect to standards for appropriateness. Um, how many, and just hypothetically speaking, and this may be something you know, Mr. Dave Reiner, if someone were to construct single family detached homes on that parcel, how many could they put in with the current zoning? Three, well, four, uh, you know, it two? would be reasonable to, to mirror What the, would be appropriate? Uh, well, it would be reasonable to mirror the um, uh, image that's across the street. Uh, okay. And perhaps Seven add one. Eight. Something. Eight. Six plus a corner. Oh, right. It could be about eight. Approximately eight single-family residences. And I, I'm just envisioning what the impact in, on that whole area, which is also a wooded area, would be of eight single-family residences. Um, okay, thank you for that. Then the other question I have, which is the uh, procedural point, which I think I understand, but I just want to clarify, is that this is a preliminary plat approval, and I think as has been indicated multiple times, there's a final plat approval. So if a preliminary plat is approved, there's going to be a whole other process down the road for final plat approval, and lots can happen between preliminary and final. And at the minimum, for final, it would go through the, does it go through the plan commission again? Yes. Correct. Yes. So it would go through staff again, it would go through the plan commission again, and it would come to the council again. However, the standard for final plat approval is compliance with all the detailed ordinances, the sort of technical ordinances, and whether or not the final plat substantially conforms to the preliminary plat. Okay, well that and was... And so the, the real decision, you. as far as the policy direction, is at the preliminary plat stage. Okay, well, that's why I asked that question. I wanted to know, because I heard the references to we can continue to work on these things between preliminary and final. I want to have a better understanding of what 
the criteria are and what is possible between preliminary and final, and I appreciate you clarifying that. Those are all the questions I have for now. Any other questions from uh, members of the council with respect to this preliminary plan? Other than what is appropriateness? <laughs> that ends our first reading tonight, Mayor. Thank all right, you. thank you. And uh, I just want to compliment uh, the neighbors that came out tonight and presented their points uh, very clearly and very con concisely. And particularly, again, Mr. Tom, I think you put a lot of work into your presentation. Uh, and also want to thank the petitioner for, for being here to answer our questions and providing us with the rendering. And we certainly have lots of information before us, and I'm sure there will be additional questions, more information provided between now and any final decision. And as currently planned, so for everyone in the audience. It will be on next week's active agenda. So as currently stands, it's set to be d decided upon next week's meeting, which will be one week from today, so everybody knows. And that's the end of the workshop of the first reading and that brings us to item 10 on our agenda which is the mayor's report as promised I do have an update uh, with respect to our continuing efforts I, I feel like it's a continuing mission to boldly explore how we can improve electric electrical service within our community uh, very quick background uh, three ish years ago we held the first town hall meeting with ComEd representatives after the village experienced extraordinary power outages due to some extraordinary weather. The first town hall meeting was uh, very positive and put us on a path to continue to work with ComEd senior representatives to improve the reliability of electrical service here in, electricity service, excuse me, here in the village of Downers Grove. And it was so successful that we continued that tradition and on uh, September 19, 2013, we had the third annual ComEd town hall meeting between uh, the public, businesses, residents, uh, members of the village, village council, as well as senior executives with ComEd. And I think we make progress every time we do this. I think maintaining the focus, maintaining the energy uh, behind it is very important. And while we don't make as much progress as everyone would like, the fact that we're making progress and we have ComEd's attention and focus upon our community, I think is a very positive thing. Uh, well, I wanted to share with everyone because while we stopped doing weekly updates um, with respect to ComEd, there, there have been some tangible results that have followed the September 19, 2013 town hall meeting, which was our third annual. I just want to share that with the rest of the council, bless you, as well as uh, the public. Uh, we received word from Terry Simmons, who is our main liaison at ComEd and our community, uh, that uh, in response to three action items that were identified by some residents um, at the third annual town hall meeting, the following uh, work has been done. Uh, there was uh, concern raised by residents about an uh, uh, electrical pole that was located in the rear of 5724 Dunham. Uh, quite a few comments about that pole. Well, the pole has been replaced, um, which apparently was a long time in coming, but based on the uh, town hall meeting that took place. Uh, second, at uh, 5300 Walnut in the Cameo condominiums, there were issues raised with respect to some of the residents there about flickering lights and other power quality concerns. Uh, ComEd sent out a crew to conduct an analysis of that concern after several discussions with the association president at Cameo and the resident who raised the issue at the, the last town hall meeting. It was determined that it was an internal problem related to that customer's unit only, and the issue has now been uh, addressed. Uh, so it turned out it wasn't a ComEd issue, it was a local issue, but it was addressed as a result of the discussion that took place at the meeting. And then finally, Deer Creek subdivision here in, in Downers Grove had a fair amount of attendance, a representation at the town hall meeting concern, uh, regarding some concerns they had about uh, power outages in their subdivision. And ComEd will be replacing two different sections of underground cable in that area. Uh, the work is scheduled for the second quarter of 2014. And once we know more information about the details of that, uh, we'll be able to share it but I just wanted to uh, thank ComEd for sharing that with us and particularly thank Allison for all her work with ComEd as our, um, I think we're going to start calling her Electra because she is uh, a <laughs> guru of all things dealing with uh, electrical service in the community and liaisoning, or liaising I think is the word, with ComEd uh, on these various issues. But wanted to report that out that the town hall meeting and the continuing efforts with ComEd are resulting in tangible improvements. Again, perhaps not everything, to everyone on this, the same uh, speed that uh, we would necessarily like, but uh, you know, every step is a step in the right direction. So we're gonna continue our efforts and I think they're, they're more than worthwhile. And I wanna thank staff and Allison in particular for 
um, for her efforts in that regard. So that was the uh, report that I had tonight. Nothing further on the mayor's report. It brings us to item 11 on our agenda, which is our manager's report. Uh, Mr. Fieldman? No report tonight, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. It brings us to item 12, attorney's report. Ms. Petrarca? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Only one item to present this evening, and that is an ordinance authorizing the issuance of the Village of Downers Grove revenue bonds for the Avery Coonley Project Series 2013 in an amount not to exceed $6.3 million and authorizing the execution and delivery of the bond and loan agreement between the village and the borrower and other related matters. Thank you, Mayor. That is all. Thank you very much. And that brings us to item 13, council member new business or forgotten report items. Any member of the village council have any items of new business they would like to raise with the council this time? Any forgotten report out items that anyone would like to share? Oh, Commissioner Durkin, do you have one? Yeah, I do. Yeah, heaven forbid I forget something, right? Um, as I always say, uh, during this holiday season, please do all of your shopping here locally because many of our surrounding neighbors are competing for your uh, hard-earned dollars. And we would ask you to please continue shopping and remembering Downers Grove retail in your uh, holiday shopping and uh, every sales tax dollar we earn uh, help goes to a great cause here. So we appreciate your support. And thank you, Mayor, for letting me redo that. You're quite welcome, Commissioner. And uh, there have been some uh, legislative uh, activities about the state and federal level that maybe we'll talk about next week, but perhaps a little pre premature to get into tonight. But uh, I think we may have some things to talk about next week, both respect to sales tax, particularly that conducted on the Internet, and uh, that topic that's been on everyone's mind for quite some time, which is pension reform. But more of that next week, perhaps. Uh, with How about that, Amazon drones. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got me. You got me stumped with that one. <laughs> Google it. It'll be I will. They're doing. That's right up there with Electra, I think. Yeah. All right. With that, uh, we are at the end of our meeting. I will ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. We are adjourned. Thank you very much, and good night. Yeah.